everybody. Yeah, my name is Sarah McHale with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. We are a local nonprofit land trust. Um, we've been around since 1991, so a while, whatever that math is. Um, what a land trust is, we like to preserve and take care of land, but also support private landowners who want to do the same thing. So that could be anything from working with somebody who wants to put a conservation easement on their property, which preserves it forever. Um, or it could be in a less formal way, like, hey, you just need some advice on, you know, native plants to put on your property or how to restore your oak woodland or something like that. We do consults for that kind of stuff, too. Um, we also, we've got all kinds of stuff. We do... <laughs> A native plant sale, rain, we're selling rain barrels and composters and all that kind of stuff on our website, um, which I'm going to list at the end, but it's conservemc.org. Um, we have a farmland preservation program. We have amazing restoration volunteers and staff who work to take care of our sites, all kinds of things that we do. So if you're not from McHenry County and you live somewhere else, I encourage you to find your local land trust and reach out to them. Just like get their e-newsletter list or become a member, volunteer, whatever it is. Um, and the way you can do that is by going to a website called findalandtrust.org and type your zip code in. So that's just findalandtrust.org. Um, nonprofits depend on members for support. That's how we do the land advocacy work that we do. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking all about rain barrels and composters. And this is like the basics of it. And I want to do it in a way that makes it simple and approachable for anybody. I'm going to talk about the pros and the cons of each of these too, um, and some pitfalls and mistakes and ways to avoid those as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so we're gonna start with the water conservation portion of this. Why do we even care about saving water? So really the goal is when, like we just had a big rainstorm here earlier, when water, hits your roof and runs through your gutters and down your downspouts and it exits, we want water to be able to soak in and filter in and stay in place, stay on your property, soak in, restore the aquifer and the groundwater that's underneath you. What ends up happening a lot of times though is our downspouts are routed to places that are impermeable. The water can't soak in. And you'd be surprised at what constitutes an impermeable surface. Um, it's things that are obviously concrete, okay, or your driveway or a sidewalk, something like that. But also things like lawn grass, water pretty quickly just kind of skims over to the surface of that. And what happens is water ends up going to the lowest point, no matter where it is, right? So a lot of times it ends up running over our driveways or sidewalks or parking lots through roads and it's picking up all kinds of sediment and various pollution whatever all kinds of stuff and it ends up um, just going into the nearest storm drain as you can see here which is emptying into some kind of waterway we want to avoid that we want water to soak in where it is and there's a couple different ways to let this happen so you can see on the right, we want to avoid that. <laughs> we want to avoid our downspouts discharging onto these, you know, paved surfaces or even just lawn grass. Um, for one thing, a lot of ice builds up in these areas and it's really, it's really not safe. Um, so there's a couple different ways to avoid what you see on the right there. One of them is burying your downspouts. And there's a whole variety of ways to do this, but this is a very simple solution that anybody can do. Like my husband and I and my kids, we did this to a bunch of our downspouts. And you can see that the downspout is routed into basically PVC pipe that goes under the ground. 
and discharges into that little gray canister that's under the ground. And it's got a bunch of gravel underneath it. And water can either soak out and down into that gravel where it can percolate. Or if that canister fills up because the volume of rain is just too much, it'll pop up that green lid and water will kind of bubble out, but in a more controlled way. Um, water, usually the, the piping has some kind of perforations in it too, so water is able to escape that way as well. This is just a really nice way of like not having to look at your downspouts. Like that's kind of, sometimes it's unsightly depending on where it is. it's located. It's also just way more functional and practical. Now, ideally that little green discharge thing there is gonna kind of pump water out into a planted area, something like this. So this is Betty, she lives here in McHenry County. And um, she's got some really great things going here that I wanna talk about. So first, let's look up at the deck in the back of her. You can see the downspout coming down, coming down. And then um, first, ignore the rain barrel. <laughs> Follow that downspout all the way down and you can see the black, it's called a flexible elbow discharge. You can see that and how it's routed into um, her little rain garden really. And that's a newly planted rain garden. Over time, those plants will fill out and become um, much more dense and layered. But that's fabulous. This water is coming out of there into this rain garden with native plants. And native plants have very complicated, dense, thick, deep root systems that open up the soil and allow it to act like a sponge. And so the water soaks in place. That's what we want, all right? Now, the other cool thing that she's got going on here is go back up to the deck, go down the downspout, and then you get to that little white rectangle that's called a diverter. And I'm gonna talk more about diverters later, but basically it's just a way for the water to go down the downspout. And then when that little rectangle thing gets filled up with water, it diverts through that white tube and into the rain barrel itself, which is really, really cool. And then when the rain barrel fills up, the water backflows back to the downspout and down into her garden. This is awesome. She's got a lot of really great things happening here and they're all pretty simple. To create a rain garden, she does have some little like rocks and stuff in the very center, in the low part. You don't have to do that kind of stuff. You can if you want to, but really if you just get plants in, <laughs> around where your uh, downspouts are discharging, they're gonna help absorb water, which is awesome. So I know I was gonna talk about rain barrels tonight, not just about plants. So let's figure this out. So what is a rain barrel? It's as simple as it sounds. It's just this like big old barrel that holds water. Let's start at the top. So at the downspout on that graphic, it's um, flowing down into that black, flexible thing that's called a flex elbow. Um, you can purchase these at hardware stores. I'm going to talk more about dimensions and that kind of stuff, but that will flow down and discharge the water through um, a thing called an atrium grate. Some rain barrels have that, some don't. It's not a big deal. What you want to make sure is obviously the top of the rain barrel needs to have some kind of hole cut in the lid. Could be one hole, could be multiple holes. But what's really important is that it's um, just underneath it that you have that wire mesh, okay? And you want it to be a very finely wired mesh. Um, what this is doing is it's, it's blocking sediment and leaves and debris from getting into the water itself inside your rain barrel. So think about that water that's running over your shingles and it's picking up all kinds of stuff. And then it's running through your gutters and it's picking up leaves and things. And that's all discharging out of your downspout. Um, so you don't want that obviously to end up in your barrel. So that kind of filters all that out. It also 
keeps mosquitoes out, which is really great because we don't need your rain barrel to turn into a mosquito breeding factory. Okay, so let's continue down through the rain barrel. On the left top of the rain barrel, you see hose adapter. Um, what that is, that allows you to connect a standard size garden hose. And when the rain barrel fills up, it's going to get to that level and it's going to drain out through the hose adapter, through the hose, and will drain wherever you have set that hose up for that water to discharge out of. Um, okay, so the water continues down through that hose and goes out. What else do we have here? Oh, the barrel itself. So the barrels that we sell, and, that, and we're not the only ones that do this. There's a lot of groups that sell rain barrels, a lot of land trusts and municipalities. Um, they're actually upcycled. So they are recycled food grade barrels. So at one time they were like, I don't know, held olives or something in them and were used for shipping. And so they've been completely cleaned and are available now to use for rain barrels, which is perfect because we don't need to, uh, to be having all this plastic just floating around. Let's upcycle it, perfect. Um, all right, so let's go down to the faucet, that spigot, that's where you actually get the water out of the rain barrel. So you stick like a watering can or something underneath that. Um, you can also hook up a soaker hose or something like that too. And then underneath the rain barrel itself is an elevated base. It can be uh, cinder blocks like you see here. It could be bricks. It can be a wooden platform. It can be all different kinds of things. It's important to raise your rain barrel. Um, we're gonna talk about this more, but it's basically gravity and pressure. Okay, is helping, giving you more pressure um, for the water to come out of that faucet, as well as you have to be able to get your can under the faucet, okay, your watering can. All right, so now we know what a rain barrel is, where do you put it? <laughs> and I always tell people, put it near whatever you're going to use it for. So if it's like way on the other side of the house, if it was me, I would just be lazy and not use the water itself and that would be wasteful. So um, practical uses for rain barrel water include your container plantings, like you see this little kid here watering his little container of petunias or whatever those are. Um, vegetable gardens, you can, you can water your vegetable gardens with rain barrel water. It's important to know though, that you're, you shouldn't actually take the rain barrel water and pour it directly on the fruit or vegetable itself that you're growing. So let's say you have like a tomato plant or something growing in your vegetable garden, water the soil around the base of the plant. Don't water it from the top on the actual tomato. And that makes sense. Like you're not supposed to water up on the top of the plant anyway. You wanna soak it slowly down into the soil. Um, this is because, again, that rain barrel water picks up all kinds of stuff as it's, it's coming across your shingles. And so obviously it's not safe for you to drink this water and we just don't want it to end up on our food products that we're gonna be eating as well. But putting it on the soil underneath is fine. The soil acts as a filtration. Um, Kids can use it for toys, whatever, pool toy, you know, all kinds of squirt things, whatever. Decorative fountains, you know, that's good to put it in those fountains, especially the fountains where the water is just kind of recycling and don't use it for drinking water. Um, oh, also decide, do you want the rain barrel to be seen, you know, by your neighbors or whoever, or do you want it to be hidden from view? Um, also think about, is there a place a good place where I can run my overflow garden hose. Remember from this graphic um, where it says hose adapter and then that green garden hose, that's where the water is going to overflow when this rain barrel fills up. Think about where you're running that water. It has to be away from your foundation. You don't want to end up with just water pooling against your foundation and then you end up with bigger problems. 
So think about, oh, is there a planted area nearby where I could just run this, you know, run this away from my house? All right, so you've chosen where you want to install your rain barrel. Now you've got to actually install it. So the tools that you need are pretty simple tools. Um, hacksaw, the little flexible elbow, and there's, I'm going to show you a picture of those. Something for the rain barrel to sit on, bricks, cinder blocks, a wooden platform. We sell the wooden platforms, whatever. Um, a hose for the overflow and then something to collect your water with, a bucket, a watering can, whatever it is. So the first thing that you wanna do after you have found your existing gutter and downspout is to make the area level underneath that downspout, all right? This is so important because these rain barrels, they weigh more than 500 pounds when they are filled with water and you don't want that uneven and potentially tipping over and spilling when it's full. Um, so take the time to level it properly underneath your downspout. Um, then you're gonna put your bricks or your wooden pedestal, whatever it is underneath your downspout. And you're gonna put the barrel itself on top of those bricks and mark the downspout just above the lid, okay? Where you're gonna be cutting it. So just mark it. That's what that red line indicates there. Um, then you're going to cut the downspout with a hacksaw where you marked it and save that piece that you just cut off. All right. Save it in your garage or whatever, because you're going to put it back on over the winter. Um, so then step four, you're going to put your flexible elbow on there to direct the water into the actual rain barrel and then attach your hose in step number five to that top overflow valve, okay? Um, and then you're ready to start collecting water. If you want, you can you could attach your soaker hose or whatever to the bottom. Um, so flexible elbows are the simplest way to get water actually into your rain barrel. It's important if you're going to go this route that you measure your downspout opening first. Do you have a two inch by three inch opening or do you have a three inch by four inch? Once you figure that out, then go to the hardware store <laughs> or we sell the flexible elbows too. whoever you end up buying them from. Just take your measurement first, okay? Um, how to use the rain barrel water. All right, I already talked about a bunch of this. Make sure it's elevated. Watering can just goes under the spigot. It's literally like, turn it off, turn it on. So with the soaker hose, um, a lot of times you're gonna need an electrical pump for significant pressure. Depending, it's all gonna depend on how high your rain barrel is elevated, how much water is in it, and how far exactly you expect water to be able to travel down the soaker hose and actually come out. A soaker hose is just like a long, long hose. It's got perforated holes in it and water can just slowly kind of drain out and soak into your soil. People use that a lot in like vegetable gardens and stuff. Um, to generate enough pressure, a lot of times most people end up needing some kind of electrical pump to achieve that efficiently. All right, and then in the winter, reattach your downspout with your flexible elbow, um, completely drain your rain barrel. You can't just leave your rain barrel sitting out over the winter with water in it. It's going to freeze and then it's going to crack. And all the little parts are just gonna not work anymore. Um, you can turn your rain barrel upside down and just leave it there. If you do that, I suggest that you tie it to something because it gets windy and an empty rain barrel is just gonna blow away. You can store it inside a garage or whatever, okay? Okay, so some of the pitfalls <laughs> of rain barrels are like what we see here. And this is why I give you multiple options for how to encourage water to soak in. 
because if you're going to have an issue with this, then a rain barrel might not be a good option for you, right? As much as I would love you to buy rain barrels, like really the goal is to allow water to soak in. So things like burying your downspouts, having native plants around, those are all other ways to achieve it. Um, so what's happening here is there's like a significant downpour and this one downspout is draining a large section of roof and it quickly overwhelmed this rain barrel. So even in like five minutes or something, one of these 55 gallon rain barrels that was empty could fill up with the big enough roof. So, and you could see the overflow is overwhelmed, like the, this not even touching anything. So there's two different options. Um, one thing you can do, and I don't have a picture of it, but it's basically the same thing. You can buy a, a rain barrel that's gonna have a wide overflow. So instead of a standard garden hose size fitting, it's going to be a bigger circumference and you end up with a bigger hole and a bigger hose. So that makes sense, right? That can handle a, a larger volume of water at a higher speed than that small little garden hose, okay? So a wide overflow rain barrel is, is one option. Another option to avoid it is to use the diverter. So remember back to Betty that I showed you in the beginning with her awesome little rain garden and that rain barrel, and she had that diverter. So on the left there, that's the diverter. There's all different kinds, okay? There's, and it's all gonna depend on you. What kind, like there's some that are automatic. There's some that you have to physically manipulate and turn them off, turn them on. You know, there's all different kinds. So it's gonna depend on you and what you want. I like this automatic option um, because you don't even have to think about it. It really, who wants to be like, oh, it's raining. Now I have to go outside and screw around with my diverter. Like nobody wants to have to do that. So this takes care of it for you. So in those two little bottom graphics there in the, in the left picture, you can see the inside workings of the diverter. So what happens is water comes out of the downspout, and I'm looking at that one on the bottom left there. Water comes out of the downspout and it goes, you know, catches in the bottom of that little green rectangle there. And when it gets to the top um, or to that linking hose there, it travels through that linking hose and into the rain barrel itself. Perfect. Now look at the little mini graphic on the right there. The rain barrel is full. You could see that, that the level of the rain barrel, the water has gone over the top of that linking hose. So the water then backflows, okay? And it's diverted back down through the downspout itself. All right, so, so in this case, using the diverter, the section of downspout you cut off isn't just sitting in your garage you're using it, all right? And so then the water is diverted back down your downspout and it discharges. And you can have it discharged with that buried, um, you know, the buried uh, downspout that's like underneath the ground. Perfect, if you wanna do that, wonderful. So I really like this automatic diverter option. Um, another thing you can do, and you could do this with the diverters too, is link multiple rain barrels together. You can do as many of them as you want. I would suggest you check with your municipality. Sometimes there are regulations on how many rain barrels you're allowed to actually link together. Um, so how this works is the water comes out of the downspout through the flexible elbow and into that black rain barrel there on the right. And, um, look down at the bottom of the black and gray rain barrels, you see that tiny green linking hose. All right, so in the, the black rain barrel, it only fills up to the level of that green tiny linking hose on the very bottom. It then flows through that and into the gray rain barrel where it kind of equalizes 
and they raise the gray and the black at the same time, the water level. Perfect. When it reaches the top, there's your overflow um, through those green garden hoses. Perfect. You just route those wherever you want it to go. So notice these are tied together. Okay. That's like the whole wind situation again. It's nice to keep them from blowing away. So you can combine all of these methods together. You can use one method. Like you can always change from using a flexible elbow to a diverter. Like, you know, you're not always just tied into one thing. Okay. So on to composting. And, you know, composting is related to water conservation. It's really um, kind of richening up the soil and adding oxygen to the soil. It's making it more porous, which is allowing water to soak in as well. So first, what is composting? Um, it's just you taking a bunch of stuff that you normally throw away and turning it into something usable. You're turning it into hummus or it's a type of soil basically. And um, things, it's organic matter, things like food scraps, things like leaves, things like lawn clippings, okay, all kinds. And I'm going to go through what you can and can't compost. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, for one thing, it it's like totally free. It doesn't have to cost anything. It's keeping all of this stuff that would normally go into a landfill. It's keeping it out of a landfill and it's making it useful and it is enriching the soil hugely, okay? Adding organic matter, minerals, that sponginess with, with oxygen. It's just over time, it's really opening up the soil. It's wonderful. All right, so what can and can't we compost? So in this graphic, notice we have greens and we have browns up on the top. Those are both things, examples of things that can be composted. Um, the greens are adding nitrogen, the browns are adding carbon. So what's important to remember is that your ideal ratio of greens to browns when you're composting is two greens to one brown. And it says that down in the bottom right corner of the graphic there, two to one. And so greens are things like your food scraps. So your banana peels and your apple cores and whatever, all that kind of stuff. You know, the stems of the herbs that you're not going to eat. Okay, perfect. Um, coffee grounds. And yes, you can use the coffee filters too. Um, if it's got like staples and stuff, anything that has like staples, I try to take that out. Um, I like to use the unbleached coffee filters and all kinds of things. Your fresh grass clippings, if they are not chemically treated, if you're chemically treating your grass, don't put that in your compost, right? I mean, compost is going to be used in things like your vegetable gardens and to incorporate into say a tree or something that you plant. Like, why would you want those chemicals in that, right? You don't need that. Um, other garden waste under the greens. So plants, stalks, flowers, let's talk about that. So yes, let's say you have, you know, you pulled out a bunch of, let's say dandelions or something that you weeded out of your garden. Here's what I would do. I would not put the flower heads into my compost, but the leaves and stuff that I would put into my compost. Anything that has the ability to potentially turn into a flower and then seeds, you don't want that in your compost. Backyard compost is generally not gonna get hot enough to um, sterilize those seeds. So you don't, you just, you want to avoid that. You don't want to end up spreading weed seeds all over the place. And there are some plants, some noxious weeds like garlic mustard, where even if you pull it out of the ground and it's got a flower on it, if you put that whole thing into your compost, that flower could still end up completing its cycle and making seeds, even pulled out of the ground. It's crazy. 
Um, what else? Okay, so all kinds of stuff you could put in for greens. Browns, leaves. Leaves are huge. Like, I am always shocked when people are bagging up their leaves and putting them at the street to be taken away. These things are so useful. <laughs> I don't know why people do that. I'm the crazy person that's like, can I have your leaves? <laughs> I'll take them. So you can add those to your compost all through the year as a source of browns. Perfect. You can spread leaves on top of your garden beds. You know, like there's so much that you can do with leaves. Um, so it does help to shred up your leaves before you put them in your compost. Now, here's the thing about doing that. And I always, all right, so it's kind of a catch-22. Shredding them up helps it break down faster. But there's usually like cool, tiny pollinators and stuff that are living in those leaves. There could be like moth cocoons and stuff in the leaves in the fall that look exactly like leaves. And if you shred it up, obviously you're shredding up the cocoons too. So like save some leaves, you know, like have some leaves be on your garden beds and then shred up some of it for your compost pile. Um, there's all kinds of things, shredded newspaper, you know, whatever, crushed eggshells. Oh my gosh, I put so many eggshells in my compost. Uh, wood ash, some wood ash. <laughs> okay, we have a wood burning fireplace here in my house that we use pretty much every single day over the winter. Like from November to March, it's running almost every single day. That would be too much wood ash. That would overwhelm. That would be too much brown, too much carbon. So a little bit can go in there, okay? Um, so things we don't want to put in our compost, any meat products, any oil, um, it's like fatty things, no dairy, nothing like that. Again, the weed seeds, don't put your pet waste in there. Um, glossy paper, diseased and in, uh, insect infested plants. Don't put that in your compost. Like if you're like, why does this, you know, why is this flower all misshapen and just deformed and weird? Don't put that in your compost. Chances are it's got some fungus or something in it and your compost probably won't get hot enough to um, sterilize that. All right, so again, our ideal ratio of greens to browns is two to one. So two nitrogens to one carbon. Problems happen, the smell happens um, when there's too many greens, too much food stuff, okay? And then if you have too many browns, it's not going to break down over time. And you guys, you're not like measuring this, you're eyeballing it. <laughs> really, you're just eyeballing it, okay? Um, the brown material though, that two to one, that's like when the browns are compressed. So not like this giant pile of puffy leaves, you know, when it's all kind of packed down. That's how you measure, how you kind of eyeball the volume. Um, what I always do is just, and I'm like kind of a lazy composter. Let me see. Oh no, I don't have. Okay. I just like take a pitchfork and open up a hole in the middle of my compost pile and put the food scraps in there and then cover it back up. I have never really had a problem with critters getting into it either. So I think that's because we end up with a lot of browns in there. And so there's no smell really attracting them. All right, this is a neat little thing to use in your kitchen to keep your food scraps in. Um, I like any container, you can use any container, it doesn't matter. I like this one because it's got a charcoal filter on the top, which is nice because it absorbs smell. And just keep it in a convenient place where you're actually going to use it and put the food scraps. Then you decide what type of composting works for me an open pile, which is what you see on the left, or do I need a closed container? And there's pros and there's cons to both of these. The open pile is like super easy and cheap. And it doesn't even have to be like with this wood surround. It could just be a random pile on the ground. Um, 
bugs are totally able to get into it. It's awesome. And that helps break everything down. Beetles, worms, and all kinds of stuff. The, the con is that, well, for one thing, you see it, right? Some people don't like how they look. And then another thing is it takes longer to make actual usable compost because lots of heat is escaping. Um, the, the composter container um, has some pros and some cons too. A con is they cost money, um, but they're neater and you're not gonna have to worry about critters getting into it. And you end up usually with faster compost because heat is being kept inside. And these piles can be just a single pile like you see there, or it could be multiple chambers, as complicated as you want to get with this. Um, with the multiple chambers, what you're doing is you're like transferring um, as different stages of decomposition are happening in your compost. You're kind of moving it until the very end is like the finished compost, all right? You don't have to do that though. <laughs> um, if the enclosed barrel is the right option for you, there's two different kinds. There's a stationary and a tumbler. What we're looking at here is a stationary composter. It's literally just a barrel that sits still. And the way you use it is you unscrew the top there, that black top, you unscrew it, dump your, um, food scraps or leaves or whatever, dump it in there. And then when you're ready to take some out down at the bottom, you just open up that little hatch. Um, you don't have to turn it in there. I mean, you can like stick a pitchfork in there and kind of like mix it around a little bit. You don't have to. I think if you mix it around, it's good. Like, I don't know, every few weeks or something. And you know, with these rain or with these composters and the open pile, the more sun they have and the more air circulation there is, the better the compost is going to break down. Oh, and these don't require that much space, these little stationary composters. Now, in the tumbling composters, they require a little bit more space. Um, and they're going, this is a 55 gallon. So this is gonna hold a little bit more material too. A con to the tumblers is they're heavy, especially when full. Cause what you're doing is you're literally taking that, you can see how it's, how it pivots there and you're swinging it back and forth. And it can be heavy and it takes up a little bit more space because of that too. Cause you have to actually be able to swing it. The way it works is you unscrew the top, put your food scraps in there, and then you swing it around every, however often you think about to do it, once a week, whatever. Um, those bars in that graphic on the right there, those bars help to break up everything. The center tube is where air and water can kind of circulate. Um, there's little holes and perforations in the top and there might be holes in other places too, where tiny insects can get in and out, which is good, you want that. Um, here's the thing though, that's tricky about these tumbling composters. To get the compost out, you flip that whole thing upside down and you, and you have the lid unscrewed and food, you know, your compost just kind of pours out. So, I mean, that's tricky in and of itself because it could be heavy. And then the other thing is your compost, all of it is like at the same stage of decomposition. So that's a little weird. It's not like in a pile or in that stationary composter where you just take from the bottom this is like, no, it's everything comes out at once, okay? And some people like that. Some people like getting those large quantities compost out at once, and then you kind of start over. I mean, you can put a little bit of compost back in there, which speeds up the process of starting over. But just keep that in mind, like when you're investigating the different kinds of composting options. All right, so sunnier locations lead to quicker compost, whether you have a pile or uh, some kind of enclosed barrel.
um, whatever, mix all your stuff up, turn it every few weeks. This is, this graphic is just like an example of some layers. You do not have to be this complicated at all in order to be a successful composter. Um, I didn't start with large branches or a wood pallet. Mine was just on the ground. So, you know, you do what works for you. Um, how do you know when you have, when the compost is ready? When you like stick a shovel or something underneath it, what you pull out is black and crumbly and it smells like rich earth, all right? So like black, crumbly, light, fluffy, it's just wonderful stuff. Um, okay, so there's a complex method of layering everything like this. And then there's like the real life method, which is just throw your stuff in the center in a hole and like cover it back up with a bunch of leaves and other things. Okay, so all different things you could use for compost, your house plants, um, it's basically free fertilizer over your lawn if you have enough compost. You can use it on top of your flower beds, your vegetable gardens. I like to put it on my vegetable gardens in the late fall. And then again, in the very early spring, you know, so I'm talking like beginning of March or something and end of November is when I like to put it on my vegetable gardens. Uh, vegetables are really heavy feeders. They extract a lot of nutrients out of your soil. And so if you're never putting nutrients back in, then your soil is just gonna become depleted and your vegetables aren't gonna grow successfully. Um, you can use it around trees, you know, trees that you've planted in place of wood mulch, like wood chip mulch doesn't do anything to enrich your soil. It really doesn't. Compost does, all right? And then like when you're planting new trees, shrubs, plants, you can mix compost in with the soil, all right? Um, I wouldn't use all compost. Like if you're planting a tree, just like have all compost in there. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't mix it up with some topsoil and fill the hole in that way. Okay, so we um, run a program called Conservation at Home. And it's not just us that does this. There's tons of different organizations uh, in the Chicagoland area. So multiple states that run this program. But it's basically a program that's like, we come over, we do a site visit, we answer your questions. And if you've got some native plants in your yard, and um, you're doing something to let your water soak in and you're doing these things, you get a yard sign, which is kind of a cool way to talk to your friends and family about what you're doing. Um, if you have none of those things yet, we don't care. We will still do the site visit for you and advise you, okay, on the right ways to do these things. Um, the fee for the site visit includes a one-year membership to our organization, which is huge. That's how we do the work we do. If you're out of the county and you want to be put in touch with somebody, just email me. There is my email address. Don't call that number because I'm like never in the office. Email me <laughs> and I will put you in contact with whoever your conservation at home person is. There's other organizations all across the country that do similar things to this, okay? Like Wild Ones is a nonprofit that does this. So there's all different kinds of groups. Okay, and these are just a lot of different people around our one little county who have all created this community of people that are doing things like composting and saving water and putting native plants in and removing invasives and all kinds of awesome stuff. When we all do a little bit, it makes a difference, okay? So I encourage you to get involved. All right, so with that, I'm going to look at our questions here. All right, um, so we have many white and scrub pines in our yard. What would be the pros and cons of adding pine needles to compost? That's a good question and I don't have an exact answer for that. I would need to look into that for you. Um, Pine needles are gonna be very acidic. So I wouldn't overwhelm your compost pile with them. 
I would use them in moderation. Um, yeah, that's the best answer I have for that is just to use, use a small amount of them. Okay, but I suggest you research into it more because that's just me kind of guessing. Um, how do you shred leaves? I lay them out on the grass and just run them over with my lawnmower is how I shred leaves. Um, do you clean the eggshells? No, <laughs> no, just throw it. We just throw it in there. Does it matter if the compost location's in the sun or shade? It's best if it's in the sun, Rhonda. It's gonna break down faster. But if it's in the shade, like if that's the only option you have, that's fine. It's just gonna take a little bit longer, okay? Do you have to water your compost when it's decomposing? And if so, how often? All right, I never water my compost. The rain does that for me. And even with those barrels, they have like perforations in them. So water gets into there. You can, you don't have to. I guess if you're in like a total drought or something for months and months and months, you take your rain barrel water and throw some of that in there if you have the water. But otherwise, simple rainwater does a good enough job with it. So you wouldn't need to do that. Okay. Okay. I think that's all the questions we have. Let me see. All right. Perfect. I think we got it all. Oh, do you recommend putting compost bin far from the house? All right, Lindsay, no, I don't recommend putting it far away from the house because then it's a pain to get to <laughs> and use. So mine's right near my house. It's like 10 feet away from my back door where my kitchen is. I never smell it and we never have critters. And I think it's just because we keep that, and it's just a coincidence, but we keep that ratio fine, right? So, so we're not, I don't have too many greens in there too many food scraps that's going to lead to a smell and so I've never I've never really had a problem with that in my experience if it's far away then me and my kids we're not going to use it we're not going to actually put the food scraps in it so it doesn't have to be far away from your house good question okay I think we got them all and if there's any other questions that come up feel free to email me and there we go. There's my email address and just reach out. So with that, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Find your local land trust and reach out, get involved. Barb, you got anything else you want to say? I just want to thank you again for, for presenting tonight. And I will also to everyone, I will include Sarah's email. I always send out a feedback email the next day. So um, in case they missed it on this, but Oh, I see another question has popped up. Okay. Oh, good. Because I also wanted to add something. Oh, thanks, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> it was a thank you, Sarah. So <laughs> Perfect. Oh, our rain barrel sale um, is open, I don't remember, through the beginning of May at some point. Okay. It's on our website. So pickup of the rain barrels and composters and plants and trees and shrubs, we've got those for sale too. Um, is on May 14th and May 15th in Woodstock. We can't ship anything. It's local pickup only. So I encourage you to go to our website and check that out. Oh, and members, yes, you guys attended this presentation. So we're giving you the member discount. So glad I remembered this. The <laughs> code, the code is just the word member. <laughs> M-E-M-B-E-R. So go ahead and use that code to get a 10% discount too on anything you buy from us. That's awesome. That's is that all for people who are already members or you're saying- No, people anybody that today? like watches this program, okay. go ahead and use the code. All right, awesome. Okay, well, I do not see any other questions. Thank you again, Sarah. This was wonderful. And everybody have a good night. I will send this out to you tomorrow morning, the recording. Perfect. Thank All you right. so much. Take care. Bye-bye.